and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the first time for restoring all the things about which God spoke about by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. They would. And said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Witnesses of these things. Alleluia. Amen. The Lord be with you. you. Let us pray. O God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 11 through 21. While the lame man, who was now healed, clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico, called Solomon's, astounded. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us, as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer 
to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until a time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. This is the word of the Lord. Please follow in your bulletins the responsive psalm. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us some good. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when, they, when their grain and wine abound. In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. The epistle reading is found in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1-7. through 7. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, and he is righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. As they were talking about these things, the things that happened on that first Easter, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me 
in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the gospel of the Lord. We join now confessing together our common faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated now as we join in singing the hymn of the day.
because he lives, all fear is gone. In our gospel lesson today, Jesus said, peace be with you. And may the peace of our risen and victorious Lord be with each and every one of us. Amen. You may be seated. The word of God for us this day is that appointed gospel lesson we read just a few moments ago from the gospel according to St. Luke in the 24th chapter. It takes us back again, as we were last Sunday, to Easter evening. Remember last week we talked about it from John's perspective and we focused a little bit on the disciple Thomas that Sunday night and a week later. Tonight we get Luke's perspective on that Easter evening visit of Jesus to his disciples. As we prepare to hear and meditate on God's word, let us pray together. O oh Lord, as you spoke and revealed yourself to the disciples... So we pray now come to us in your holy word. Open our hearts and our minds. Enlighten us with your scriptures as you did the disciples and encourage and strengthen us in our faith. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. In my work at Greenfields, a lot of times when I visit various people, Especially in the afternoon, I get the treat of seeing some of the afternoon television programming. They spend a lot of time uh, watching television, and that's good. And one of the channels they seem to, many of them, uh, go to is the Game Show Network. All these old game shows on TV back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and so forth. I guess... Uh, you could do a lot worse. Uh, you could tune into so many other things on television that are, are violent and vulgar. But the game shows are kind of fun. They play along. One of them I've noticed quite often is this game show called The Match Game. Maybe you know it. It's a, a panel of uh, celebrities and a couple of contestants, and they get a word or a clue, and, and the whole idea is to match what the response would be. For example, if I gave you a clue, what, what do you think would be the number one response of everyone gathered here today if I say, here's the clue, faith, Elma. Yeah. <laughs> what else would, yeah, faith. Could say faith Lutheran, I suppose. But there'd be many responses. So let's try it one more time. And I want to hear what your response would be. Easter Sunday. That seems to be the number one response. This is the third time I've preached this sermon. Uh, this week at Greenfields, and last night I had a quick pitch in uh, for a pastor whose wife was uh, tested positive for COVID and uh, they're quarantining. He couldn't take the service uh, this weekend. Yeah, Easter Sunday. What else could you have said? Well, Easter Easter, he's risen, you could say that, yeah. Or Easter, come on. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't tell anybody I did that. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's many responses. Now, what happens sometimes if a contestant's just kind of tricked and you get the clue and they don't know what to do, they don't have a clue, you know, and they don't know how to respond, and if they come up with something really strange, the audience grumbles, maybe even slightly boos a little bit. And, and so if you said Easter and the contestant said fear, can you grumble a little? Uh, you probably would think, oh boy, that's not going to match any of the celebrities. But I'm going to suggest to you, if you go back to that very first Easter, What's the dominant emotion throughout that whole third day since Jesus was crucified? We call it Easter joy and resurrection, but uh, uh, what's the dominant emotion? I would suggest to you it's fear. 
All kinds of different fears. The fear of the Pharisees even led to this. They were fearful that Jesus was becoming too popular and people were going to like him and they would lose their position and their uh, source of income. Pontius Pilate, full of fear. Fear of the, the people revolting or, or complaining to Rome and then the emperor wouldn't be happy with them. He could possibly lose his job. A fear of the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. They all abandoned Jesus, and now on Easter night, where are they? They're locked up in a room for fear of the officials coming after them. The women on early on Easter morning, they go to the tomb, and when they see the angels in the empty tomb, what are they filled with? Fear. Fear. They, they, weren't, they didn't get down and say, oh, Jesus Christ is risen today. They didn't do any of that. They didn't praise God for fulfilling his word. They were fearful. The fear of John, the disciple. Remember Peter and John run out to the tomb, and John uh, is a little faster, a little younger. He gets there, but he doesn't go in. He's afraid, but Peter, he goes right in. The Roman soldiers, when the angel came and rolled the stone away from the tomb, they were described as being like dead men, paralyzed with fear. Even the chief priests, when they heard all of this, they were fearful. They made a deal with the Roman soldiers. They paid them, they bribed them to say, if anybody asks you, the disciples came and took his body away. A lot of fear. So different than our Easter celebration, isn't it? When we gathered for Easter, there were all kinds of flowers here. It was beautiful. Um, we have Easter or joyful hymns in our service, maybe special uh, music or solos or all kinds of different things to mark the joy of the day. Uh, in the old days, before COVID, we would have even had an Easter breakfast and could have gathered together and uh, continued our celebration and our fellowship. All these things are so different from that first Easter. And it struck me this week, I've preached, I don't know, probably 35 Easter-type sermons over the years. And I never really noticed this. I thought, my goodness, it's not about Easter joy. It's about Easter fear on that first Easter morning. And our disciples, when, when Jesus appears to them in that upper room, our gospel lesson described them as startled, frightened, troubled, and full of doubts. They were doubtful too. Last week we talked about the doubting Thomas. Really, they're all doubting Thomases, even by the time of Jesus' ascension later to his glorious throne in heaven. The disciples still don't quite get it. Not so much doubt, but they just don't understand it until they receive the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Jesus' disciples were full of fear, and he tries to dispel that fear. He says to them, Shalom, peace be with you. He probably said that many times to the disciples. And they would have heard his voice and seen him. Hopefully that was a, of a calming uh, uh, sense to them in their fear. Shalom. And he shows them, look at my hands and my feet. It didn't say in our gospel, my side, but behold, it is I. I'm not a ghost. The Greek word that the disciples said they thought they saw spirit is what we heard. It's not the same word as we hear for the Holy Spirit. It's a word more like uh, our English word, phantasm. It's a ghost. They thought they were seeing a ghost, and they were afraid. And so he asks, uh, do you have anything here to eat? And he eats a piece of broiled fish. A ghost doesn't do that. I remember in uh, Sunday school, um, oh, it must have been about this time of the year, our Sunday school teacher challenged us, and he said to us in class, if Jesus just walked into this Sunday school room right now, how would you respond? Um, I've never been shy about responding. And I said, I'd be afraid. And he kind of put me down a little bit and suggested, why would you be afraid? It would be the Lord. I think the same reason would be that uh, the disciples were full of fear. I'd be afraid. Well, let me ask you, 
If Jesus walked right in here today, how would you respond? How would you feel? Would you get down on your knees right away and say, oh Lord, or would you be a little fearful, a little afraid? This doesn't happen every day. I know what I would do. I would let him finish the sermon. <laughs> so as we look at this, I don't think we ought to look down on the disciples for their fear or many of the others. In fact, is fear such a bad thing, really? Fear sometimes is, is good, and it can cause us to see certain behaviors in order uh, to protect ourselves and be safe. But yet fear is seen as negative, and it's a sign of weakness oftentimes. So I don't know, what do you fear? I'm sure you have some fears, maybe some even phobias, and we know there are some very popular ones, heights, water, crowds, fear of death. These days, maybe fear of COVID, uh, of uh, catching the, the virus and so forth. Maybe today, fear of getting scammed and having your identity stolen from you, all these different things. Do you think there's such a fear called the fear of God? That you're afraid of God. Well, does God really want us to fear him? I know you remember back to the days of your confirmation classes, and we're going through Luther's catechism, the meaning for the very first commandment. What does this mean? What does it say? We are to what? Fear, love, and trust in God above all things. I, I was confused by that in confirmation. Now, Luther's catechism and our, our pastor at the time explained, well, it's not being afraid. It's really fear in the sense of great awe and respect. I, I never quite bought all that. I, I still kind of thought there's a little bit of that fear of being afraid of a holy and righteous God, and I am so undeserving and so sinful that how can I even exist in his presence? There is that kind of fear. And I think, honestly, that's what Scripture teaches. And we can learn that from the first Easter as well. You know uh, the words, the very wise words of Solomon in, in the book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom, understanding, yeah. So there's something really positive about fear, at least faith-filled, holy fear of God. Fear is real, God is real, and I think a fear of God is real as well. When Jesus was sending out the 12 disciples to go on their first missionary journey, he gives them all kinds of instructions, and he says this to them, fear not, those who can kill the body, because he told them they're going to get rejected and persecuted a bit. Don't be afraid of that. Don't fear those who can kill the body, but fear him that is able to destroy both body and soul. And I believe that's kind of the direction of the holy faith-filled positive fear of God. And we Lutherans talk about that but we have different words. We talk about law and gospel, and we know God is a holy, righteous, unchanging God, and his law stands. It doesn't change. You can't break his law and have him come back to you and say, eh, that's okay this time. We'll let it slip. We'll let it slide away. He can't do that because he doesn't change. His will remains always the same. And under that law, as we stand before him under that law, there is that sense of fear of the one who can kill both body and soul. And I think that can be a positive fear, especially when it's supported by faith. Any of you might have smoked and quit? Why did you quit smoking? Well, did you do it because you woke up one day and said, you know what, I want to start, I want to turn over a new leaf and I want to live a, a healthy lifestyle and besides these cigarettes are getting awfully expensive, I'm wasting a lot of money on them and all these things. Or, or was there a little more of a motivation of fear? 
because those who continue to smoke for a prolonged period of time are surely more susceptible to some health problems, perhaps uh, uh, fear of cancer or maybe emphysema or COPD. And, and so you were driven by fear, perhaps, or the doctor telling you, if you don't stop this, you're not going to live very long, or things like that. And I think that's exactly the kind of fear. Let me ask you, and here's one of my fears. You go to the mailbox and you get the mail, and there's all kinds of uh, mail in there, mostly just advertisements. But ah, oh, you run across an envelope from the IRS. Oh. Now, what's your reaction? Oh, they remembered me. I'm so happy. I don't think so. You're probably thinking with great fear, oh no, what did I do wrong? Oh boy, I didn't think they'd notice that deduction or whatever. And so you're even a little bit fearful of opening that envelope to find out. So there is that sense of fear of God. And yet, in faith, we know better. In faith, we also know that this God is the God who loved us so much that he fulfilled all the law. He fulfilled all the, the prophecies. He fulfilled all the Psalms. And he has redeemed us as lost and condemned creatures, won by the blood of Christ our Lord. And so we hear Jesus speak to us. Shalom, peace be with you as well. That peace of the reconciliation between an unchanging God and a sinful human being that now is reconciled because Christ paid for all those sins on the cross and because he lived perfectly and holy for us. And so as Paul then writes to the young Timothy in his second letter to Timothy, he says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. God desires, I believe, healthy and faith-filled fear. And in light of his grace, as we see in the gospel, as revealed to us, that fear is in awe and wonder. There's the respect, that honor, that, that Luther was talking about in his catechism. That is that kind of faith-filled fear in our epistle lesson today. Look at the love that the Father has lavished upon us that you and I should be called, what? Children of God. That's awesome. That even while we were his enemies and rebellious in our sinfulness, he indeed came to us. Now for us, there is another sense of this fear too. You and I know better. You know the law of God. You know God's will as it is revealed in his word. And when we disregard that, when we intentionally say, Lord, I know this isn't quite right, but this is what I'm going to do this time, and I'll ask for forgiveness a little bit later. Wow. Uh, I wonder how repentant God thinks you really are. And I think that's part of that faith-filled fear. You can't do that. You can't continue to go on and love the sin and then ask for forgiveness later. I know that's a philosophy of a lot of people. They decide, well, I'm just going to do this, whatever it might be. It might not have anything to do with God's will, but I'm just going to do this, and if I get in trouble, I'll ask for forgiveness later. And uh, that just doesn't quite cut it very well. I love in our liturgy, even this morning, from Psalm 130, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, our infractions of his will and his law, O oh Lord, who could stand? Not one of us. But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Wow. Well, on this Second week from the Easter resurrection, this third Sunday in the Easter season, may God bless us with a holy, faith-filled fear, an Easter fear, one of awe and wonder and respect for all that he has done for us. And may he go further, even as he commissioned the disciples 
also that he might commission us. May he also use us to proclaim this forgiveness that he has won for us and his love for all people. People that have locked themselves up in all kinds of situations in faithless, paralyzing fear. May God so bless and and endow us and equip us and encourage us on his mission. In his name, amen. We rise now and respond to our gracious God by rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always and again. Again I say rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Again I say rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Again I say rejoice. We join now hearts and minds in our prayer time to our Father in heaven in the prayer of the church. You have searched us and known us, O Lord. You understand our thoughts from afar. You are acquainted with all our ways. Such knowledge is too wonderful for us. We are grateful for the accounts of the witnesses who saw the resurrected Lord with their own eyes and touched them with their own hands. Most important of all, because of his resurrection, we know that when we confess our sins, we are assured of your forgiveness. Dear Jesus, thank you for saying shalom to us as well. We especially think of the Grotke family, every extended loved one, that they might find comfort, especially our concern for Linda. She certainly needs your physical touch, but especially the comforter, the Holy Spirit's ministry. We pray for Bill and Alice, who continue with the challenge of not having the comfort of being together, but caring for one another and seeking continued renewal and healing in their life. You are a healer. How grateful to know, we are grateful to know, that Ken's co-worker, Shelley, has had some great news your healing touch, your limiting the extent of the cancer she is fighting has brought good news, a different kind of surgery and treatment, and everyone is happy about that. We pray, Lord, especially for those who we know little details. We pray for Ron, as he may be in the hospital today, for Jen's brother John, for those who are part of our family and who are going through their own rebellious or doubtful times, draw them close to you, dear Lord. Thank you that as a church family, we can lift them to you. So Jesus, we trust in you and your loving care. Preserve our nation and its leaders, O Lord. And especially, we pray, bless our land with order and decency. Protect all civil servants, Lord, from violence and lawlessness. It seems, O Lord, our country is caught up in a tension between our police and those who break the law and pose a threat to the community. Watch over and keep our police safe. Bless them with wisdom and justice 
and curb all gun violence and disorder. Protect us from all the threats of evil, and especially the evil one and his minions of destruction. Keep us safe from the virus of unbridled sin and from the COVID-19 virus as well. And bless all the frontline workers, the doctors and the nurses, and all the support staff who minister to them. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, as you opened the minds of your first disciples to understand the scriptures, send us the power of the Holy Spirit so that we may be able witnesses to your resurrection. Grant your continued presence in our nation. Clothe us with power from on high to help us proclaim the promises of our Heavenly Father. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death, and by his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all of the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Blessed are you, Lord, our God of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. By his death, he has redeemed us from bondage to sin and death. And by his resurrection, he has delivered us into new life in him. Grant us to keep the feast in sincerity and truth, faithfully eating his body, given into death, and drinking his life's blood poured out for our salvation until we pass through death to the promised land of eternal life. Hear us now as we pray in his name and as he has taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do for the remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. And we pray. Please rise. Holy Spirit, guardian and dispenser of the holy faith, help us always to see our fellow human beings through the eyes of the crucified and risen Christ, for we will most certainly fail in our responsibility to them if we do not. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Heavenly Father are one God with dominion over us forever. Amen. Bless we the Lord. And now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 Are there any other announcements? So we had one in the beginning of the service, but... Alrighty, let's conclude then with singing our departure hymn. Tell it on the mind. 